Hello, hello, welcome back to the channel. We are continuing the Science of Fallout series with Meyer Lurk. So this is the first um, part. There's going to be several parts to cover everything that we need to cover with regards to the Meyer Lurks. So Meyer Lurk is a catch-all term for a group of mutated aquatic creatures that are found along the east coast of the continental US. They can be encountered in the Potomac River and the Capital Wasteland, as well as the swamps of Point Lookout and other um, watery locations. They're commonly encountered around Boston Harbour and the coastline, even as far north as Far Harbour off the coast of Maine. There's a couple of unique varieties as well, such as the lake lurks that you find in Lake Mead and Fallout New Vegas. So, where is it do they come from? Um, the standard Meyer lurk, like this guy here, um, has a crab-like appearance. It's widely accepted that they are mutated hybrids of the Atlantic horseshoe crab, Limulus polyphemus, and the Atlantic blue crab, Calonectes sapidus. Both species are native to the Atlantic coast of North America. So let's get to know um, these species a little bit first, starting with the horseshoe crab. So this is the Atlantic horseshoe crab, and they're found in the Gulf of Mexico and along the Atlantic coast of the US. They can live in marine and brackish water and have a chitinous exoskeleton. Despite their name, they are an arthropod that's more closely related to arachnids and crustaceans and the name comes from the shape of their carapace which resembles a horseshoe shape as you can see here. So they have shown little evolution over the last 250 million years and as such they're considered to be living fossils. Um, the Pokemon Kabuto is based on this species and is sort of revived from a fossil in the, the games. So they're really quite fascinating little creatures. Um, they have three sections to their bodies. There's the head, which is known as the prosoma, the abdomen, the epistosoma, and the spine-like tail called the tailson. The females tend to be bigger and they are capable of regenerating lost limbs. They often acquire other species on their carapaces like algae, barnacles and mollusks, which is something that we see reflected in the game in Fallout 4 as well. They have nine eyes. They have two compound eyes on the prosoma, two simple eyes above the mouth and five more on the carapace, um, as you can see in the diagram here. Um, even unhatched embryos can sense light from inside the eggs, which could explain why the hatchlings can sense danger and come out of the eggs in Fallout 4. The tail section also has light-sensing organs, and it's something that's been studied quite extensively. They have six pairs of limbs that are attached to the prosoma, the front ones being the pincers to pass food into the mouth, as they don't have jaws. They also have another six pairs um, on the epistosoma, which are specialised as gills, um, and allow them to breathe underwater and also on land for a time as long as they don't dry out. One of the interesting things about the horseshoe crab is their blood. Um, so instead of haemoglobin, which is a, a protein and iron complex that binds and transports oxygen within the red blood cells like we have, they have haemocyanin, which is a protein complex with copper instead of iron. Um, and this gives their blood a blue colour when it's exposed to oxygen rather than red that we would see in mammalian, avian and reptilian blood. The haemocyanin is within the plasma rather than inside cells, so they only have one kind of blood cell, which is called the amoebocyte, um, which is a motile um, blood, blood cell. It kind of works like a white blood cell to fight infections and kill bacteria. Um, an extract from these cells can be used to test for bacterial endotoxins and pharmaceuticals. There's also a protein um, from their blood that is currently being studied for potential use as a new antibiotic. This is essential because antibiotic resistance is a real problem for both human and animal medicine in real life. And this is something I've been saying for a long time. Um, if war doesn't cause the apocalypse, then antibiotic resistance could very well be the end of um, humanity if it's not dealt with um, soon. So the, ca the crabs, they're caught and they're bled and then released. And normally their blood volume returns to normal within a week, but the cells can, can take a couple of months to recover. Not unlike when we donate blood, um, you can't donate too frequently as your body needs time to replace what's been lost. Um, however, it is estimated that between 10 and 30% of the horseshoe crabs die after being bled. So there's concerns about this impact in their um, mating behaviour and their population overall. 
In terms of diet, they use their front limbs to break up and push food in towards their mouth. Um, they are one of the few species in their family that can process solid food. So the first part of their gut is surprisingly similar to a bird with a crop and a gizzard um, both attached to the esophagus. So the food moves through into the crop where it's kind of stored and then into the gizzard where it's pulverised. So the gizzard kind of works like teeth. Um, it's a very muscular kind of organ and then they have a short stomach and long intestinal tube with two organs attached that are known as hepatopancreases which means that they kind of take on the role of the liver and the pancreas. Hepato means um, related to the liver. Um, so they produce digestive enzymes. Um, they tend to feed at night looking for worms and mollusks on the ocean floor. They will also feed on crustaceans and small fish. They tend to stay on the ocean floor um, and as, as kind of bottom feeders, but they are capable of swimming. Um, interestingly, when they swim, they are upside down with their tails and pointing down at an angle um, and the, they use the, the tails, and, which is the kind of tail-like thing, um, they use it as a rudder to change direction and then use their legs for, for propulsion. Um, and they can write themselves if they end up stuck on their back on the ground um, or in the ocean floor, they can write themselves and they can also turn themselves around and write themselves in the water. So very, very interesting little guys. Now on to the blue crab. So the Atlantic blue crab, it's also known as the Maryland blue crab or the blue crab. Um, the scientific name is Calinectes sapidus. Um, they're found in the Western Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it is the Maryland State Crustacean and it's of great economic importance, especially around the Chesapeake Bay area. This would make them local to the area around Washington DC and most of the East Coast. Um, they can grow um, up to a carapace width of 23 centimetres, which is 9 inches. Um, the, the males typically are larger and they do have sexual dimorphism, which means that the males and females have visible differences, so you can tell them apart. Um, the shape of the abdomen, um, which is known as the apron, and the colour differences in their claws are the way to tell. Apparently, the mnemonic to remember this is that the male crab's apron is shaped like the Washington Monument, while the female's is shaped like the Capitol building, so it's domed rather than long and pointy, I guess is the the way to put it um so unlike many fish species fish species in in the um atlantic ocean these crabs are expected to actually cope with climate change and increase in temperatures and thrive um they do seem to have expanded their um area as well and they're now being found so north of cape cod in the gulf of maine um which is much further north um because of the increase in temperatures um, they have also been introduced um, into Japanese and European waters, um, so they can be found in the kind of Western European seas like the Mediterranean. Um, they are considered an invasive species in Italy and um, there's work going on to kind of eradicate them from the Adriatic Sea area. Um, these crabs are eaten by quite a range of species, including eels, bass, trout, sharks, rays and humans. Um, they themselves eat plants and small animals, um, particularly thin-shelled bivalves like clams and mussels, small crustaceans, fish, plants and even carrion. Um, they will even eat conspecific, so their own species um, and animal waste as well. Um, and they do have quite a significant commercial importance in North America um, with history of them being fished up as early as the 1600s for both Native Americans and the English settlers in the Chesapeake Bay area. So, um, you know, crab is, is quite a, an important, um, it, you know, it's kind of an important industry in, in the area. So, um, you know, the population seem to be thriving um, and they're spreading their, their range because of increasing temperatures in the water, um, that they seem to be coping well with that and thriving. Um, despite being a cold water species so um, and one of the other things that's worth noting is that there's evidence um, that changes were happening in the crab population and the lobster population before the bombs so um, we'll head over to the Nahant Oceanological Society in Fallout 4 which is a location that you can visit 
that has um a bit of information about this so the the society were monitoring um the wildlife and monitoring the water quality and and things like that and um, so we'll head over there and we'll get a look at that and see um what we can dig up so um i'll meet you over in uh nahant in the commonwealth where's the dog I'll catch up eventually. Okay, so ignore the fact that I'm in caution. It's just because I walked past some angry scavengers and a Mr. Gutsy in a house there. Um, but I've got combat AI turned off so that I can um, explore without wasting hours shooting many, many enemies. Um, but dog meets around somewhere. I'm sure he'll catch up when we go through a load zone. Um, so we're here now in Nahant, which I think I'm hopefully pronouncing that after a bit of a swim in the nicely irradiated Atlantic Ocean. Um, so Nahant is um, this kind of island, the peninsula kind of landmass here. Um, so we're kind of so almost at the most eastern point of the map. Um, And yeah, you've got County Cross in here, Crook Manor, and um, there's another settlement options here. Revere Beach, the Libertalia, um, it's here as well, and then Diamond City over there. So, this is where we are on the map. Um, so, Nahant Oceanological Society is important for a couple of reasons. Um, basically, they're um, so this is a company that, or a society that studied the ocean and um, did surveys on the wildlife and water quality and, and whatnot. Um, because one thing about the, the Mirelux that um, doesn't seem to be that common knowledge is that the, the Mirelux were beginning to actually mutate and develop before the bombs um, because of the amount of kind of nuclear waste and radioactive waste that was getting dumped in the ocean um, you know it was run off from nuclear power and all the rest of it so um, pretty sure this is that yes I know how it works again okay Two letters in common with the word read. Yeah. User Jim Prescott signed in, so internal memo. We will be shutting down for the last week of October while the bulk of our staff is in Monterey for the National Aquatic Protection Symposium. I will be remaining here to continue preparation for the harbour blockade to protest the war the first week of November. Remaining staff members, please use the week to coordinate with volunteers to get more sign-ups for the blockade. I will be working out of the research lab this week if you need to find me. Dr Casey Reid. P.S. Jim, please remember to power down the robots before you leave for the weekend. So they were basically, um, a bunch of them were at a sort of symposium, a conference kind of a thing, um, and they were preparing to block the harbour to protest the war the first week of November. Presumably that never happened. Um, since this was obviously, you know, something that was taking place just before the bombs and then goals. Here at the Nahant Oceanological Society, we strive to save our oceans by researching the long-term effects of radioactive exposure on aquatic life and working with the community to raise public awareness. We believe that companies such as Poseidon and General Atomics, that's spelled wrong, um, General Atomics have gone unchecked too long and that radical action is necessary to protect our world from a terrific future. So, yeah, they, they basically were noticing and they were aware of issues with um, the water and the effect it was having on the wildlife. And this was before the nuclear bombs came and 
um, destroyed everything else. Um, and yeah, you can see this obviously was uh, presumably an aquarium at some point. So there's a dead fish and there's barnacles the and seaweed. Indeed, 3,928 metres, which is, is pretty deep. Yeah. Absolutely not. Oh, nice. Not the most useful, but there is a Wasteland Survival Guide here for a, li a little extra perk if you're interested in that. You've got a weapons workbench. Um, but yeah, you can kind of get the indication that these were probably all aquariums or aquaria. I'm never sure what the plural is for aquarium. Um, at one point, but they've obviously long been uh, destroyed. So, hello. But there is more data to be had. I think it's in their other building. So they said, there we go. Yep, there it is. I knew I heard one. Marlot kill claw. Oh. Okay. Oh, I need to get a better look at you, buddy. So yeah, when you come out of there, there there's a whole bunch of marlurks um, underneath. So this marlurk kill clothes. So again, this is one of the higher level ones. They've got more spikes on their carapace. A bit like the marlurk hunters of Fallout 3 actually. They kind of looked a bit more like this um, and they were the higher level. And you okay dog mate? Please don't drown. I don't think the people would forgive me if I let the best dog drown. Anyway, um, so yeah, the mar marlarks have been nesting around here. Um, as you can see, their egg clutches and things. Um, but we do also have this building. which is their research lab, so we should get some more uh, useful data out of this when it eventually loads. Oh, that was quick. Well done. Okay, master lock steamer trunk. Well, I'm not going to bother with that because it's probably just generic loot anyway. There are my looks in here as well. This is quite cool. You don't really see this kind of thing. Let's see, does that make it better, better or worse? Uh, so we've got this like wooden board with some fish skeletons on it and a machete. So maybe this is where they prepared food for their aquarium species or something. Um, yeah, there's fish skeletons on this as well. Right, head down here. Um, here I come. Hello. Didn't realise we were playing hide and seek. I, I don't know if it's the Mirelurk that's got them worked up. Because I've turned off the, the combat AI so they don't... Uh, <laughs> don't really know how to handle it. Ooh, duct tape. Right, let's see. Research terminal. Okay, there we go. Casey Reed. Office keys. Can't find the keys to your office and I need to print out more of the sign up sheets. Ah, okay, that's how we get into that room that I cheated. But yeah, so there's a boat and you can get the keys. Um, but the main thing we're interested in is the uh, research logs. So, lobster growth. 
It's always a good start in scientific research. This is insane. An increase in average mass by 14% in crabs and 12% in lobsters is not something to be celebrated. If this trend continues, the additional food necessary to sustain the shellfish population could lead to a colony collapse. I've tried again to bring our findings about the growth and mutations to the press and those assholes at GNN just took our findings and spun them into a story about how great shellfish season is going to be. So they're picking up that, you know, the average size of crabs and lobsters is going up by 14, 12, 14 percent, which is not insignificant. Um, and when they went to GNN, which is Galaxy News Network, um, they were just like, yeah, shellfish season is going to be great because um, shellfish is quite a big industry in this part of the United States, so as I understand it, the East Coast. Um, so, you know, people are just like, yeah, that's going to be great. Um, increased toxicity. This is the 14th month in a row that we have seen a continued increase in toxicity in barnacles. That's spelled wrong as well. And cod. This raises the average month over month increase to 34% compared to those in the control tanks. We've tried contacting the Boston Port Authority, but they refuse to take or return our calls. So again, they're noticing changes in um, other aquatic species, barnacles and cod, um, Atlantic cod. And that is something that is a real world issue um, that um, some fish have um, abnormally high levels of things like mercury and lead in them. Um, and that toxicity is getting passed on. Um, also, microplastics is... Uh, becoming an increasing concern and again they're trying to raise awareness of this but the port authority is just like not listening um, and then samples from Lake Kwanapowit I believe is how you say that this is very strange one of my colleagues sent us a sample from Lake Kwanapowit asking for independent verification to compare against his findings the radiation and toxicity levels are 15 times higher than the sample we had from last year. Well over safe levels for people to be swimming. I've sent a report back to him to confirm his findings. So again, they're taking water samples, um, not just from the ocean, but from the lakes and other kind of waterways around the area. And radiation and toxicity levels are 15 times higher than the year before. And it's not safe for people to be swimming in the lakes, so um, that's a bit of a problem. And then we can unlock the safe. Don't think that really gets us anywhere, does it? No, just a decent pile of ammo right enough. But yeah, um, so this is the thing, because all those um, things, that was happening before the bombs fell. So uh, society here who obviously monitor, um, you know, toxin levels, monitor radiation levels in the water, are noticing changes to the crab population, changes to the lobster population, and um, nobody is listening to them about it to do anything about it they're raising concerns um about changes and mutations in these species and people are celebrating and thinking great more shellfish more food um which is quite selfish <laughs> but it's you know, it's it's one of these things. I mean, the, you know, the same thing ha has happened in the real world many times where, you know, people who understand a particular area of science um, get put down because people don't want to hear it when it's not something positive. Um, you know, I mean, look at the whole thing with climate change and there's so many people that wear deniers of climate change in the 90s I mean we were talking about uh, you know anybody that's kind of my age or older will probably remember Captain Planet um, you know and even going back further you've got the 
um, you've got Trauma and you've got the Toxic Avenger, um, which they made a musical of and it's brilliant by the way. Um, but you know, and talking about toxic waste being an issue and all the rest of it and Captain Planet talking about it. So, you know, when I was growing up it was being talked about but there was also a lot of people that were really, really dismissive of the existence of global you know, global warming, climate change. I mean, even if you ever watch South Park, you know, they got really got stuck into Al Gore um about his stance on climate change. Um, you know, and that's that's what Man Bear Pig is in South Park. Man Bear Pig is supposed to be an allegory for climate change, you know, and it was the whole thing that Al Gore was running around telling everybody that um Man Bear Pig was real and he knew and nobody was listening to him and they were all laughing at him and things and then they had to really they had to go back and apologize because you know we finally had enough kind of scientific proof for the majority of people went out a sense to sort of acknowledge and realize that actually yes the climate is changing um and it is something that we have caused i know everybody's scrambling to do something about it and it's probably too late to be honest it's it's you know i feel like the the damage has been done ah there's the key um so you know it, it's one of these situations where i think we're too late and it's probably the same for for this you know when these people were finding the um changes to the crabs and the lobster populations in the, the Atlantic Ocean and then it's like well is there any going back from, from that now and there probably isn't to be totally honest um, and it's that kind of thing of just that you know it's like it just almost seems like people are dead set on just denying things when there's even when there's clear evidence and lots of scientific proof that things like that are happening that that these um situations are happening that these things exist and you know it's the same with the pandemic and you know suddenly everybody's decided that they're an expert in immunology or an expert in virology or something um, and spewing all this misinformation and talking about how wearing a mask is going to make you breathe in carbon monoxide when that's literally not possible um, but then those of us that, that maybe do know what we're talking about and do know something about viruses and do know something about immunology um, are getting told that we're shells of big you know the kind of thing I'm talking about so that about does it for today um, for the first part of the Meyer Lurk series um, there's a lot a lot to talk about so um, it's going to be split up I think probably about 5 videos in total about half an hour each um, so hopefully you find this interesting as we introduce the kind of origins of the Meyer Lurks and where they came from um, the next part will cover what the Marlurks are like in game. We'll be looking at their where you tend to find them, um, things like that, um, and we'll um, learn a story about a young man called Rory Rigwell, um, who was trying to domesticate the Marlurks basically. So um, that's going to be the next part. We're going to learn a bit about the. Um, the Marlurks in the game um, what they're like, what their habits are where they tend to be found, all that kind of stuff um, so if you enjoyed this then um, drop a like and um, if you want to see more I've got quite a, a few things I've covered um, rad scorpions and all the bugs I've got a sort of playthrough of Vault New Vegas on the go and a series talking about Vault Tech and the um, horrors that they've introduced um, into the world so um, there's plenty there and plenty more to come so um, hit subscribe if you want to see more and get updated whenever 
um, a new video gets uploaded and um, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Um, any questions, any thoughts on Marlurks or any um, any funny anecdotes, anything like that, drop them in the comments below. I'd love to hear it um, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.